Good morning. Thanks for joining me this morning. Um, I hope you have your favorite warm cup of uh, whatever you drink in the morning, coffee or tea. It is uh, chilly out there this morning. I think the last time we talked, it was 100 degrees and now it's half that. So welcome to Coffee with a Cop. Um, I'm excited about this presentation. We finally got a distracted driving uh, law, texting and driving um, law in Arizona, and we've been um, issuing warnings for upwards of a year and a half. And Carly was a big uh, proponent of the distracted driving law that went in to effect. And I worked on a, a group with her at the Capitol um, and gave a presentation alongside of her. And I'm excited to have her with you today. I did want to mention one quick thing before we get started. And that is, uh, we have a little group of individuals that are, they want your stuff more than you want your stuff now. Uh, and what they're doing is seeking out unlocked uh, vehicles with keys in them. So just going to remind you to take your nine o'clock walk, uh, make sure that your uh, valuables are pulled out of your vehicles, your keys are out of your vehicles, uh, and your vehicle doors are locked. And then when you come back in after checking your vehicles, uh, please remember to lock all your exterior doors from your residence so uh, so that we can um, stop this little trend that we have going. And with that, uh, I just want to introduce Carly. And Carly, it's great to have you finally uh, give her this presentation. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here and it's nice to see you guys again. So uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, you know, this session is on understanding our journey to distraction and changing our behavior behind the wheel. And before we begin, I want to just let you know that this is not an attack on what we do behind the wheel. I truly believe that safety is a community effort and whether that's on the job site or it's for safety on our roads, as a community, we have to support each other and we have to work together to change that behavior. No one's perfect, uh, but when we understand and accept our behavior, that's when real change can happen. So um, I know that everyone has seen uh, this information that's been going around Paradise Valley. It is illegal <clears throat> in Arizona to talk or text on a cell phone while driving unless the device is in hands-free mode or it's an emergency situation. And uh, citations, as Chief Wingard had said, begin January 1st of this next year. So what is distraction? Uh, there are a couple definitions and, and my favorite actually happens to be the second one. Uh, it's a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. And it's also extreme agitation of the mind or emotion. And I think that as we look at our, uh, our driving habits, I'm sure that many of us can identify with extreme agitation of the mind or emotions at some point or another. And risks associated with distracted driving. When it comes to the risk, we've seen, we've seen the news, we've seen uh, the commercials, we've heard the story, some other people, if, if any of you had attended the Distracted Driving Summit, there were some survivors and even people that had caused crashes because they were distracted. The risks of driving while distracted include increased insurance rates. Of course, we have vehicle crashes, property damage, injury to self or others, and uh, loss of life. And maybe we've been witnesses to a crash. Maybe we saw where a crash was responsible for, um, or a, a crash was caused because directly of distracted driving. We also know it's dangerous to drive distracted. We do know this. And as I mentioned earlier, starting in January, police officers will be issuing citations. And some other risks that are associated are the risks that we don't really see, and that's on the back end. It's what we're left with when we injure or kill somebody. Aside from potential jail time, as we've seen in the news before, uh, we have to live with that for the rest of our lives. People who are hit in a crash suffer post-traumatic stress and lifelong injuries resulting from that crash. And some of them affect the way they do the most simplest day-to-day -day things. But then also people that are responsible for taking the lives of someone else or even injuring someone can also suffer post-traumatic stress. They can also suffer depression. They have to live with that guilt and anxiety and, and so forth for the rest of their lives. No distraction that's worth taking your eyes and mind away from the task at hand, which is driving, is worth any of that. And we also need to understand distraction. 
And before we can solve distraction, we have to understand distraction the different types that there are. And we've all been distracted. No one's perfect. We've all been distracted one way or another. And it's not just about the cell phone. We get distracted when we use our cell phones. Yes, we do. But that includes hands-free. Attempting to voice to text in a car. How many times have you had to correct your message when you were uh, trying to voice text while you were in the car because of road noise or bumps that you went over? How long were you focused on correcting that text when you're trying to voice to text? And we get distracted by the technology in our vehicles, the touch screens that we have, the system navigation knobs, and uh, they're all located in various locations in our car. Some of them are directly on the dash and some of them are in the console below. That takes your eyes and mind away from the, the road as well. <clears throat> we also get distracted by what other people are doing on the road. For example, if we see someone swerving in their lane, have you ever slightly, just slightly, increased your speed to kind of catch up to them to see what they're doing and there they are they're on their cell phone and what do you think don't you know you're not supposed to do that you're all over the road why don't you just focus on driving and then what do we do just a few minutes later as we're driving past them and moving on and maybe we've forgotten about it we hear our our cell phone chime or ring and oh let's look at it we get distracted just by multitasking and that's something that we need to understand as well. Have you ever stopped at a drive-thru for coffee in the morning? Coffee. Uh, we pull up to the window. We pay for the highly anticipated cup of deliciousness. And we pull away. We take three or four really good pulls on that straw and that happiness just fills your mouth. And you're just so happy. And then because we're really safe drivers, what we're trying to do is focus on the road and we're trying to find that perfect that where is that hole for the, for the cup holder in your car? And when you think you have it, you let go of the cup. But then you have that sound of the lid popping off of your cup. You hear the liquid splashing into your seat. And as if to add insult to injury, you hear the ice bouncing around on the seat and on the floor. What's your typical reaction? Is your reaction a calm and collected, oh, I'll see if I can pull over and take care of that. Or are you someone who experiences surprise and panic? Would anyone in the car next to you know what just happened based on your reaction and how you're behaving in your vehicle? Are you desperately trying to soak up that liquid in your seat with a tiny little napkin that they give you at the drive-thru and then it's not working and then you're searching for a towel, you're searching for a shirt, and you're sure you didn't leave that shirt in your trunk and, and you're really starting to get really, really nervous about this. But during that time, did you happen to notice how many places and opportunities there were available for you to pull over to take care of the mess? What about when you're driving to a familiar location? How often have you just let, your mind just happens to take over. You start thinking about what you're about to do. Maybe you're thinking about something that happened the night before. Maybe you're thinking about something that's going to happen later in the week. And our autopilot takes over. And all of a sudden you're at your location. I, I arrived. How did I get here? Did I run any red lights? Did I miss anything? Those are some of the examples of distraction that I think that most of us have experienced at some point or another. And understanding and acceptance. The rest of this presentation is gonna be looking at our behavior and how we got to this point. And while we go through it, I'm gonna ask you to reflect on your own journey to distraction. What do you think has been socially acceptable? And I also invite you to write down your own journey to distraction. And finally, at the end of the session, uh, we're gonna put it all together. We're gonna to understand how we behave the way we do behind the wheel and some of the changes that you can make that are actually really easy. I know that when we think about changing behavior, especially something like this, it can seem overwhelming, but we're gonna make it really easy. And then at the end of the session, I'm also gonna provide a community challenge to everyone so you can see how we have allowed ourselves to shape our own behavior when it comes to our cell phones. And I think you'll find it interesting and, uh, and an insightful activity. I'm really excited about it. So let's look at our own history of distraction. And again, I invite you to reflect on your own. Think back to when you were a child in the back seat of your parents' car or another family member's car. Do you remember looking out the window? 
Do you remember watching the other cars on the road? And what do you remember seeing? What I remember seeing is, is people that were unfolding those giant maps and they would have it in front of the, of the windshield blocking their entire view, trying to find what road they were gonna go to. How can they even see the road? I also discovered at that point because I, sorry, mom and dad, I happened to see you, uh, you also put a map in front of you and drive with your knees. And then also seeing people push that map onto somebody else to fold it up. How are they looking at the road and the map at the same time? Those roads are so tiny a map. How'd they do that? And then I also remember a gentleman who had uh, a hard shell taco without the wrapper or a napkin. And when he bit into it, the way he was holding it, amazingly, the taco seemed to completely explode and all the contents went all over him. Uh, definitely surprise and panic happening in that moment uh, when, when I witnessed that. I also remember seeing people read the newspaper or a book or go through a file, um, I'm assuming while they were on their way to work. I also remember seeing women that were doing their makeup while they were on their way to their wherever they were going. The eyeliner and the mascara behind the wheel made me so nervous. What if they hit their eye while they were driving? And I remember watching to see what was gonna happen next, if that's what was gonna happen. As a teen driver, I remember my friends and the enormous CD books that, they were huge. And I knew anyone whose car was broken into, their entire library of CDs was taken out of their car. And, um, you know, they would be fumbling through this CD book with the, this giant thing on their lap, trying to thumb through each page. And that book was not easy to keep open. And you had to really break it in. And so it's hitting the steering wheel. If there's other people in the car, why didn't we hand the book to our friends and have them take care of this? Uh, you know, turning the pages, you kept hitting the steering wheel. And I also remember myself uh, being incredibly distracted at the time trying to go through my glove box, trying to find that new CD I just got uh, or that new cassette tape. I also remember uh, you know, the loud car rides and stereos and the laughing from all our friends and joking not only with the, the other passengers in the room that are in the car, but also everyone, uh, including the driver. We were so distracted. I, it, and I know that that's not a, an unusual thing. I know that um, we've all done that when we were teenagers and, and it continues to happen. As an adult driver, I began to understand the hurried mornings and trying to finish my makeup, but I was actually afraid to do it while we were moving because I remembered thinking about the lady that would poke her eye out uh, with the eyeliner and the, and the mascara. And I also zoned out after a long day. Maybe I was thinking about something that I didn't want to deal with later that day, or maybe I was thinking about something I was looking forward to, or maybe I was thinking about what I would need to do when I got home, if I was getting ready for an event later that evening, what would I wear? How would I do my makeup? Or maybe I simply just got lost in thought. We do that frequently. And this is something to think of, this is something interesting to think about. And, and this is all, I'm gonna focus on this a little bit as well. But when we were old enough to start driving, we had already been learning through watching other drivers on the road or the drivers in our own household. So before we even got behind the wheel, we already had an expectation as to what was acceptable based on what we witnessed. And I'm gonna use the example uh, from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that research shows that children whose parents buckle up are much more likely to buckle up themselves. When buckling our seatbelts, our children pick up on that behavior or that rule. First, you get in the car. First, you buckle up. Then you start the car. Then you make sure everybody else is buckled up. And then you start to move. So again, as you're thinking to your own journey to distraction, what behaviors did you pick up from your parents? Or what behavior do you distinctly remember? And when you taught or when you teach your children how to drive, of course, we want them to be safe. We want them to drive well. Now, if we add all the behavior in from everything that they watch out of the windows of our vehicles, the other drivers that are on the road, as well as the behavior that we ourselves exhibit behind the wheel, as, and also how do we interact with the technology that's now in our vehicles? What could we have displayed to our children or our grandchildren? 
regardless of what we teach them, when we get behind the wheel, we are very specific about the, these are the rules behind the wheel. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. However, if we're doing those behaviors ourselves, we're only showing our kids that this is actually really okay, that you don't, don't pay attention to what I'm saying, just follow what I actually do. Now, I can tell you that I, I've spoken to a few schools in the East Valley in regards to distracted driving. And I've asked them that question, what are you noticing? First, you know, it was a driving school. What do you notice from what your parents tell you or what your class is telling you how to drive? And then what are you actually witnessing within your own vehicle uh, when you're in your, with your parents? And they absolutely are paying attention to everything that we're doing, absolutely are. And what these kids have said is that their parents are teaching them that it really is okay to text and drive or talk to text and drive, multitask and drive, and that we don't really have to pay attention because the technology in our car will tell us if we're swerving out of our lane or about to hit someone or something. But is that really the right way to drive? They're also afraid to speak up, even if they're worried about the safety of everyone in the vehicle. Why are they afraid? They're afraid they're gonna get punished. Why? Because if they've ever said anything to their parents in the past, they were, they were told things like, I've been driving longer than you've been alive. I know what I'm doing. Have you ever said that to your kids? Or even I'm the parent, you don't get to tell me how to drive in my car. Or speak to me like that again and you'll lose X, like whatever it is that they're gonna be losing. And I still encourage them to speak up because there's nothing wrong with standing up for your safety and the safety of your family and you just want them to drive safely. I also encourage them that if they did get punished for doing something like that, that later on approach their parents and have a family discussion as to why they said something and why it was important for them to, to speak up. It isn't easy to hear when we're wrong and that goes for anybody, but we also don't wanna send a message that no matter what the rules are, we can still do whatever we want and no one can tell us otherwise because that's really what we're telling our kids. Now, again, as moving through our own history, I, I encourage you to keep writing some information down just to try to discover yours. Do you remember the first time you looked at your cell phone when you were driving? I remember the first time I looked at mine. And yes, I used to look at my phone while I was driving. I, again, nobody's perfect, including me. Uh, this is something that I had done as well. I remember needing to use the number keys to send a text message. So if, if uh, it was wrong, you're really going back to really start correcting your, your errors on that, on that flip phone. But the thing that I remember was, I felt at that time it was really important for me to look at it, but I also knew it was dangerous. I was also really nervous the first time I did it. And I remember thinking, this is so dangerous, but it's just gonna be really, really quick and everything's gonna be fine. And what happened? Nothing bad happened. I put the phone away. I had that rush of, oh, that was so dangerous, but I'm okay. The second time I did it, little less, little less worry about looking at it. The first time I did it, I was fine and nothing bad happened, but I'm still a little nervous. The third time, less of that. And the fourth time and any time after that, nothing bad happened. And every, luckily, luckily I was okay. And by luck, I mean, I was lucky. So social acceptance, as I said in the previous slide, when we look at, or the previous slides, when we look at being in the vehicle as a child, looking out the windows, the important thing here is what I saw when people did these things was that, and I mentioned the previous slide, nothing bad happened. There was no crash. Nobody ran, ran into anything. No one was pulled over. There was no punishment nothing bad happened. So right there, that showed me as a child that this was typical behavior on the road and that it was okay. And every time we saw something and don't remember seeing a crash or anyone getting pulled over or stopped for this, you could say that reinforced or would have reinforced our perception of what was acceptable behind the wheel before we were even old enough to even get behind it. So that's something to really think about. Uh, as we drive and become more confident with distractions, what do we tell ourselves or others to get in the car? Have you ever used the, don't worry, I'm a really good driver, or I know what I'm doing, just like we tell our kids. In reality, we have merely been really lucky if we're not involved in a crash due to distraction. That's what it really comes down to. It's not that you are that good, it's you are lucky. 
if you don't have your eyes and mind on the road, how do you even know what you're really doing? How do you know where you're going? Even if it's just a few seconds, roads curve, uh, people stop, something runs out in the middle of the road, anything can happen in those few seconds. We reason our way to reinforcement of our behavior. We say things like, it was just a second, or was it? Was it more like seven? Each time we allow ourselves to be distracted, and this is important, and nothing bad happens, we're reinforcing that behavior that we are convincing ourselves is okay to do. Because again, the outcome, nothing happened. Next time you receive alert on your phone, when you're not driving or not behind the wheel, count how long it takes you from the time that you hear that, that uh, chime or ring or text message or whatever on your phone. Start counting from the time you hear it to the time that you pick up your phone, to the time you open your phone, to the time that you get to the app, that it, whichever one it is, and look at what it is that made that noise. Count the seconds that it takes you to do that. Then when you are, even whether you're walking, because we walk distracted as well, and we can, we've can we seen people run into things or other people because they're walking while distracted. Count, also, if you're listening to a song uh, at the same time that you're doing this, how long through the song are, it does it take you to get to that point? And then, Think about how long it takes you while you're behind the wheel to do all of that. And how long is that really taking you and how far are you really going? So in addition to being a primary reinforcement of our behavior, what about as the passenger? Have you silently sat in the seat, in the passenger seat and praying that you're gonna get to your location safely? Have you ever spoken up? Are you comfortable with anyone in the driver's seat driving while they're distracted because eh, it's just the way the person drives? What about the vehicle itself? How much technology is available in your car? For me, I have a touchscreen and I can access multiple systems directly from that touchscreen, which is on top of the dash in the middle of the car. I can set my driving preferences. I can set my navigation. I can set my music from satellite or whatever is on my phone to my contacts. And just because that touchscreen is right there and it's a little higher up, more than they usually had been more a little further lower, uh, does it make it safer than using our phone? It still takes our eyes and mind away from the task, which is driving. And just like taking your eyes away from the road when you're looking at an alert on your phone, if it takes you three to four seconds to find something in particular in any of those systems and, 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 or entertainment, how far have you really gone in those three to four seconds, especially if you're driving, 65, 75 miles an hour. So understanding our human behavior, let's look at our routines. And, and again, if you're taking notes on this, I encourage you to think about your own routine when it comes to your cell phone. If you were to write down the first thing you do when you wake up, what would that be? I've asked that question before and the response I usually get is, I get out of bed. Okay, what wakes you up? Response could be an alarm. Okay, was that alarm on your phone? Let's just say for the purpose of this presentation, it is. So you're waking up to your phone. Maybe it's the alarm or maybe you set your notifications uh, from coming to you until a certain time and that's what wakes you up. And then maybe you might check to see if uh, anything needs your immediate attention this morning, uh, anything that came through last night or maybe very early this morning before your alerts were allowed to come in. Maybe you check your favorite news and weather app uh, maybe you do a quick, what did I miss on social media? And once you get up, you get your coffee, you get dressed, ready for your day. Where's your phone? Right here, right? It's usually right near us, at least for me. Um, whether working from home or you're in the office, our cell phones are with us. And most of the time we respond and answer them quickly. Throughout the day, they're not far. They're either in our pockets, they're in our hand. Maybe they're, um, they're right there on our desk where we can feel it. They go everywhere with us. And think about how you respond to your phone. And when I, res when I say respond, that is anytime it rings, vibrates, or an app alert comes through, this is, you look at the screen. Maybe you just look at it. Maybe you push the button to stop the alert come from coming through. Maybe you turn off the ringer. Maybe you pick it up and put it back down, face down, so you can't see it anymore. That's responding to your phone. And are you a 
quickly to get it kind of person or are, is your style more, I'll get to it when I can. Think about what your style is. Me, I know that my style is get to it quickly. That's just, that's my typical style. And whatever your style, this is another way in how we are reinforcing our behavior and our relationship around our cell phone. So let's say if we're consistently responding to our phone as quickly as possible, anytime that we're awake, is it fair to say that our reinforcement of that behavior, along with the reinforcement of the behavior behind the wheel, could also mean that it would be easier for us to forget that we shouldn't be looking at our phones when we're driving. What about when we send a text message? How often do you get anxious when you don't receive a response immediately? For those of you that, I, that have iPhones, those three little bubbles are like magic, right? We send a text message and we're looking for those three little bubbles or those that the bubble with the three dots to come up in it. And they're responding. They're responding to me. We feel great just seeing that. When we get a when we get a text message back, we feel great. How often are you checking your phone if you're not getting a response to see if they did respond? And when we received a response, even an auto response that someone's not available, how do you feel? Do you feel you can move on to the next thing so you can stop checking your phone? That's just something to think about on, on our behavior. And so when we look at changing behavior, small changes can, can equal a big impact. So you may have been working on identifying your own history with distraction, how we've shaped our behavior behind the wheel. And so let's look at how we can change it. While change, as I mentioned earlier, can seem a bit overwhelming, we do, there's lots of organizations that do have some really easy tips for you. And I will say this, however, it does take a conscious effort every day. But once you begin to consistently do it, it will become automatic. It really will. And I can say that because I've done it. I've had to do it. First, uh, set your phone to connect to your car's Bluetooth when you're driving and turn on the do not disturb while driving. Your car does it for you. You don't have to do anything other than that initial setting up of those settings. Typically that setting is under the do not disturb feature, at least on an iPhone. I'm not sure about a, uh, an Android, I apologize. Um, but do not disturb while driving, activate and then select Bluetooth. Incoming calls are allowed, but any notifications from text messages or any other app that you have that might come through are silenced. And what's nice about the do not disturb while driving is it'll send a text message to anyone that may have messaged you. So they know that you're driving, but you're gonna get back to them as soon as you're able to. We kind of get that warm, fuzzy feeling when we know that, oh, okay, we know someone's driving. We know someone's driving, we can move on to the next thing, they'll get back to me later. And something I did find out about this feature is that if I use my USB port, that it is connected directly to the car, not to Bluetooth. So I have to use my auxiliary charger to get the Bluetooth to work. Also, before you begin to drive, set your navigation and your music before you leave. If you're using Bluetooth for both, music and navigation will come through over the speakers. Should anything change to your route and you need to grab your phone, pull over where it's safe and then go ahead and do so. Another part of changing behavior is becoming the verbal passenger. Um, say something to the driver when they text and drive. I, I was in the car with a friend uh, who texts and drives constantly. And I asked him, please don't do that while I'm in the car. And he turned to me and said, don't you ever tell me that again? Well, me being me, uh, I did tell him what I thought about his response. And in the summed up version, I told him that I'm a safety professional who advocates for this very thing. And I'm involved in the effort to prevent death and incidents on our roads, specifically for texting and driving. And while I might be in the passenger seat, that doesn't turn it off. That doesn't, it doesn't end just because I'm in the passenger seat. It should be all the time. I tried to offer solutions. How about I navigate your phone for you while you're driving? And this way you can focus on the road and I can look at your phone and I can figure out where things are. That was not an option. And what he actually did tell me in his response, and, and if you have done this as well, some people may be upset because what he told me was this, was way more important to him and everything that was happening on this phone was more important than my life. It was more important than your lives. It was more important than anybody else on the road and anybody's property. And so what do I do? I don't ride with him anymore. 
Uh, if a bunch of us are gonna go meet up somewhere, I'll either go with somebody else or I drive myself. And he did ask me, why don't you ride with me anymore? Because you text and drive. And I'll remind you about our little conversation that we had where you were very adamant about me not telling you to do this anymore and that I was not, a, you weren't gonna allow me to help you with this. You're not gonna change, I'm not riding with you. My life is more important than what's happening on your phone. So when I speak to high school students, I encourage them to say something to their parents and I tell them that story because of course they have friends and their friends may make them feel unsafe. Maybe they ride in a, to and from school with a friend's parent or caregiver and their parents trust them with that person to get to school safely. How many people do you trust with your children to get them safely somewhere? What if your child told you that they were texting and driving? How would that make you feel? How would you, that make you feel if they told you that they were nervous because they were watching that white line just go in and out from underneath their car or that they almost hit someone or they almost hit something because of what they were doing. Even when their parents are driving distracted, I also encourage those kids to also speak up. Also be a silent ambassador. You don't actually have to say anything. Uh, you can add a line to your email that says that if you're responding from a cell phone or another mobile device, you can just put something that says, send from my iPhone, never while driving, done. Another way is on your voicemail. There's a message, my voicemail at the very end of it, uh, after my greeting, I say, if I'm driving, I will return your call when I reach my destination. And finally, have a plan and be prepared. We have safety plans in the workplace. We have evacuation plans at work, even at home. If anyone has practiced a fire drill at home, in case of an emergency, we have spare tires in our car or a number we can call if we need assistance on the road. Uh, we may have a first aid kit in the car, plenty of water uh, in case we get stuck. What about having a plan to get yourself set up before you start driving? Do you have everything you need? Do you know exactly where you need to go? If you plan on getting coffee, do you have a plan in place to pull over to clean it up in case there's a spill that happens? Do you think about what you'll need to take care of anything? Should, should anything spill, whether it's food or drink? You have everything you need that's easily accessible when you pull off, to, off the road to do it safely. Like a gas station, convenience store, drugstore, car wash, anything like that. And some final thoughts. No one starts their day thinking that they're gonna be in a crash. That's just not what we, we don't leave the house going, I think I'm gonna be in a crash today. Nobody does that. And you certainly don't wanna cause a crush because you're texting and driving or because you had read a, a text message from somebody else. So if you're driving and are expecting a text or need to send one, pull over where it's safe and out of the way of traffic to do so. Ask your passenger to be a designated texter. Allow them access to your phone and to respond to calls or messages. And do not engage in social media um, or scrolling through messages while you're driving. How many of you see on social media the people that are in their car and they are either doing TikTok or they're doing uh, like a Facebook Live or something and they're in the car and you see everything just whizzing by them as they're moving? How is that safe? And do you call people out on that? Do you tell them, hey, can you not do that anymore? Because it makes me really uncomfortable. I'm really worried something's going to happen to you. Also, a uh, cell phone can be habit forming. Struggling to not text and drive, you, again, activate your do not disturb feature on your phone. Uh, you can also put your cell phone somewhere in the back seat, somewhere in the trunk, you can turn it off. Uh, and you can also let people know that are in your life that, hey, I don't text and drive, so if I don't respond to your text message, I'm probably driving, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And for more information, there's a link here to the Arizona Department of Public Safety on hands-free. And I know that you've seen this as well uh, that's been coming uh, from your police department uh, on, your, on your flyer. So town emergency alerts and notifications and the Paradise Valley Arizona.gov alert PV. So this is something I'm really excited about and this is a, a challenge that I encourage you to do. Um, the purpose is to understand our behavior in relation to our phones. If we feel that we're ignoring our typical behavior that we had accepted and enforced over and over again, then we have a greater understanding of what can actually take our attention away from a task like driving. So what you'll need is you'll need 30 minutes 
you'll need your phone and you'll need people that you live with. I know that with social distancing, make sure you're following social distancing requirements, maybe in a large area, maybe with your neighbors somewhere, um, or even uh, through video conferencing. Why 30 minutes? How many places can you get to around the valley in 30 minutes? Your phone will need to have the ringer um, on and volume all the way up. It should either be held in your hand or in your lap, but it needs to be touching you. You need to actually physically be holding your phone in one way or another, hand or lap. And where are you gonna do this? Again, either at home, uh, if you have a community group that's small and follows social distancing guidelines, um, or maybe you get together with your neighbors in a cul-de-sac and stand at the end of everybody's driveway. The task is do not respond. And again, respond is looking at it, picking it up, turning off the little ringer, whatever. Um, for 30 minutes, and while you are with those that you're involved in a typical activity, maybe you're playing a board game, maybe you're having a conversation, maybe you just finished dinner and you're having a family discussion. Uh, make sure that you do it when there's no uh, deadlines or anybody uh, is ill. Uh, make sure that you have some 30 minutes to spare while you're doing this. And um, the rule is add 10 seconds to each participant um, who responds to their phone. And the important, it'll be important for you to note, how do you feel during that activity? Uh, anytime that you receive an alert or a phone call and you're not allowed to respond to it, you're not allowed to lose your train of thought you, and keep going and doing what you're doing, you're not allowed to look at it, you're not allowed to touch it, how do you feel? Do you feel anxious? Was it hard to stop yourself? Or did you take the challenge and had no issue whatsoever? If you're one of those people, you better start making bets on that, make it a little interesting uh, as you do that with your, with your group. Another thing to take note of is how you felt after when you were able to finally look at your phone and you're able to see what you missed. But I think the other thing to take note of is what did you actually miss in 30 minutes? And I think that's important. And so finally, I'll, I'll open it up to some questions if we have any. If there's anybody that has questions, you're able to either raise, raise your hand or you can submit a question uh, via the chat feature. Carly, I just wanna thank you for joining us uh, this morning. And I wanted to, I had a couple of uh, uh, council members that have joined us and I wanted to recognize the, them and ask them if they wanted to say anything. Uh, so first, uh, Mayor Jerry Bian Wilner, uh, joined us and uh, Mayor, thanks for joining us this morning. I hope you got a great cup of coffee as you uh, watch Carly's presentation. Thank you. Uh, you know me well, Chief. I had a great, uh, great morning cup and uh, midway through the second cup, so it's going well today. Carly, thank you very much for a great presentation. Thanks for your work on this, Chief. Um, thank you for your work on this. We're grateful to the legislature for getting the law uh, revised, and which I think more than anything has helped raise a lot of awareness. Um, Senator Kate Brophy McGee and others who worked really hard on this. I think it was actually all the legislative 28 um, district delegation that was working on it together with, uh, if I recall, representatives Lieberman and Butler as well. But um, again, just appreciate all the great tips. And uh, Chief and, and Officer McGee, thanks as always for putting this together. You're doing a great job with the virtual presentations and keeping everyone in the loop. And thanks also for the reminder on uh, the nine o'clock rounds. I've got that ingrained in my mind and and um, continue to share that information with others. So great presentation and uh, happy holidays, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to get to learn some more uh, important public safety tips. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Council member Ellen Andine. Thanks, Chief, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for attending the um, Coffee with a Cop. I have not had my coffee yet, so I am looking forward to running down stairs at uh, the dealership that I work at and getting a cup. So uh, great presentation. Thank you, Carly. And I did want to give a shout out to um, Senator Kate Brophy McGee and, and LE28 representatives for uh, helping get this uh, uh, push through the legislation. legislation. Uh, great presentation, and um, it, this is such an important um, uh, bill for us, um, you know, 
that text can wait, the call can wait, the email, the post, those can wait until you're safely parked and uh, not operating a vehicle. It does save lives and it could be yours. So um, appreciate the presentation. Uh, thank you for all the hard work and chief as well on your, uh, you were on the working committee there. And um, uh, I know we had a couple distracted driving summits as well. So just wanted to thank everybody for attending and for the presentation. Have a wonderful holiday season and please uh, stay well. I yield. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also council member Anna Thomason. Always a pleasure. Good morning, Chief Carly. Good to see you again. Uh, I will echo my colleagues' uh, words of gratitude. Thank you for all that you're doing. Um, the footer on my town email account says, safety matters, please don't text while driving. Love it. And I, I have the uh, notice on my phone as well. And behavior change is hard. So Carly, thank you for walking us through that behavior change exercise. I know as hard as we think, it's, uh, it's just that reptile brain instinct. So thank you for coaching us through some change and uh, thanks that you for all that you do for us. Thank you. Have a and great one. Thank you. And if, if you need any assistance with anything, my contact information is here. Uh, my phone number, my email, carly.baez at sdb.com. I'm happy to help you with, with any questions you might have or any of the activities um, if, if you need anything. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other questions in relation to the program uh, that Carly or I can answer? I do see one and I'm not sure if I understand it completely. It says, is anyone dealing with media in having police actors drive safely? And then it says, not turning head to other actor. I know that there are national campaigns going on that include the media right now, which um, focus on distracted driving. And so some of the information that we've been providing over the last two months does include uh, tips and uh, to assist people with um, reducing their distractive driving. Um, so police are out actively uh, sharing that information and that's something that's a national campaign. I don't know if that helps um, answer your question. Also additional information that's been provided is that um, check with ABC 15 Safe Roads Initiative, um, Operation Safe Roads, that will have more information there as well. Great, I'm thankful for you joining us. Uh, I know it's early for a lot of you. That's why we drink coffee while we're doing this. So thank you. I hope you have a great holiday season. Please stay safe, do your nine o'clock walks. And uh, yeah, Dr. Pepper, I see. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, and um, stay healthy, keep your mask on to uh, not contaminate others if you have it. and keep it away from you if you don't. So I appreciate you joining me, Carly. Thank you so much for the presentation. You've just been a bundle of energy on this topic for uh, many years. And I'm uh, uh, finally appreciative of having you come out to Paradise Valley, even if it is virtually and uh, do this presentation. So thank you very much. No, thank you for inviting me. I was so excited to do this. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of education on this topic. And I know COVID took over when we were supposed to have our year of education. So I'm really excited that, that you found it important to educate the, the residents of Paradise Valley. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, that makes me really happy. So thank you. And it's great to work with you again. Thank you. All right, everybody have a great uh, morning and uh, a great holiday season. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.